Welcome to the Working on Wellbeing podcast by the World Wellbeing Movement. The podcast that allows you to be a fly on the wall during conversations with the world's leading wellbeing experts. I'm your host, Sarah Cunningham, and in today's episode, we'll hear from one of Ireland's leading mental health advocates. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome today's podcast guest, athlete, musician, broadcaster, podcaster, um, author, um, and of course, mental health advocate and mindfulness expert, Niall Breslin. You are so welcome. I'm delighted to be here. I wish I was there in person. Oh, well, Niall, you know, you've an incredible story and many of our listeners will already be familiar with your story. But for those who are not, um, I guess I'd say that there's career pivots and then there's what you've done. So you pivoted from being an athlete, as I said, to a musician. And, and really, then you became a bit of a household name in Ireland before pivoting into a career, a very impactful career in mental health advocacy. Were there sort of moments along that journey that led you to realize that ultimately you wanted to work in well-being? I think there was that common denominator throughout all of my careers was that my inability to actually deal with my mental health. And like I started out as an athlete just because I was big and lanky and that's what happened. You were may play football or rugby in Ireland and when I was 13 or 14 years of age, I started experiencing quite, at the time I didn't know what it was, it was 1993, uh, panic attacks. Uh, I'd just come back from Israel where I lived with my dad. He was in the United Nations and we kind of walked straight into the middle of a, a nine day war, which had this kind of, I don't want if you want to call it post-traumatic, but whatever it was, this kind of prevailing impact at a very changing time in my life, 13, 14 years of age. And... Yeah, I, I kind of spent 15 years of all those careers with a kind of torturous mind that ultimately took my rugby from me because I wasn't able to function. I wasn't able to eat or sleep. I was, you know, I was self-medicating on Xanax, which was hardly a performance enhancing drug because I was always terrified I'd be drug tested. And then actually, in reality, music, I always say sport is what I did. Music is what I am. Yeah, Music, I live and breathe music. My mum's a music teacher. Uh, I was, uh, my granny passed away. She gave me her piano mm -hmm. when I was a child. I lived on that piano and my brother's a music producer. So music had a different energy for me altogether. And it was a very therapeutic one. And it felt like it was more in my control. So then when I retired from rugby, I started a band, but it was just like, it was the maddest story. Like I, like I rang my rugby agent, who's this really big South African rugby agent. And I says, I'm retiring. And he just said, you know, at the, that week I was offered an, an international contract with Scotland because my mum was Scottish. And he goes, you're what? I says, I'm retiring. And he goes, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be a musician. <laughs> and he, to be fair, didn't laugh. He says, have you any demos or anything? Will you send me a demo? And I says, I will. So I sent him a demo, not realizing that he shared an office with the Oasis manager, Marcus Russell. Wow. And he played it to Marcus. And a week later, Marcus was at our gig in Dublin. Wow. He loved it. And a, a few a few weeks after that, we were signed to Universal Records. So it was it was that fast. And then the band broke up because same thing. I wasn't dealing with my mental health. I wasn't actually able to cope. And I moved to London where I worked as a songwriter for 19th Entertainment, Simon Fuller, who, you know, Spice Girls and all the above, David Beckham. And I that's where I had the kind of a breakdown. That's when things just became too much. And... Um, I thought by outrunning it, I could I could get away from it, but you can't. That's one thing I've learned in mental health. You can't outrun it. But during that period, then I became a coach in the TV show, The Voice. But ultimately, uh, I ended up working in mental health advocacy and going back to, into academia to study mental health at, at a kind of um, into the weeds with it, really, not just because of my own story, because I grew up in a country that I knew people were tortured and they weren't talking about it. Uh, Ireland, I adore this place. I'm very proud of being Irish, but it has a very dark history yeah. of not dealing with stuff and batting it down and passing it on from generation to generation. And I kind of made the decision that I didn't want to pass on that baton anymore. 
as a an Irish man, I wasn't going to pass it on to my nephew or if I have children, I'm not going to pass it on to them. And I think that's what's happened in Ireland now. And I kind of want to make sure that also, not only am I talking about this, I'm offering solutions to systems to how do we actually deal with this better? How do we come at this and how do we create a paradigm shift and how we look at mental health and well-being? Yeah. And, you know, you say you're talking about it. I have to say, I, I remember when you first started talking about it publicly about 10 years ago, and I remember thinking, gosh, how brave you were, because there is and there certainly was 10 years ago and there still is a stigma around mental health. And it's not easy to kind of come out and say, listen, I've been suffering. Um, what was the hardest part for you about as a public figure, as you very much were in Ireland at the time and, and still are, about actually coming out and sharing that story? Um, the hardest thing, I wrote in a piece of paper the day I decided to publicly talk about it. And I was on the biggest TV show in the country at that point, The Voice. I wrote a piece of paper and I gave it to my parents and I said, I am going to lose my job and I am going to have to leave the country. But that's OK, because this is I always said it, it was less terrifying to tell people now than to live with this on my own for the rest of my life. That was the maths I was doing in my head. And at that point, I really did expect that because uh, not many people had said anything in Ireland. You know, it's a, it's a big conversation now. And you're right. And I think it's important I just pick up on this. We are eroding the societal stigma around mental health, but unfortunately, the real stigmas in mental health are systematic. They're ingrained into the very systems that govern and run our countries. And that's the problem. You know, in many cases, I was nearly refused a mortgage because I had been on medication for my mental health. I have friends who are in first responders who are now not getting promoted because they had sought help for their mental health. So we need to stop looking at society and saying, destigmatize when our actual systems and our health systems are even stigmatizing because the health system in Ireland when it comes to mental health offers you really one option and that's a medical model. Yeah. That in itself is stigmatizing because you're saying there's something broken in the person rather than something that might have happened to them, a trauma they might have experienced. Uh, and the first question that should be asked and anyone walks into the door of a mental health issue is what happened to you? Not what's wrong with you. So all of this systematic stigmatization is is developed, but it's come from generations. And in my PhD, I'm looking at the first institution that was built in Ireland in 1817 by the British by the British Empire. And I'm following it up to today. And I'm following that journey. And we had legal acts called the Dangerous Lunatics Act. That's what it was called, that prevailed for a hundred years in Ireland. And it was the only legal act in the world that could criminalize somebody before they actually committed a crime. So if you want to talk about stigmas, you've got to go that far back to see how they get compounded and they grow. And stigmas operate around three things. First, stereotype. Stereotypes are just the lazy tropes we throw around. Most of us don't actually believe them. We just say them because we've been conditioned to say them. You like lunatic, psychopath. Most people who say those types of things aren't bad people with negative intentions. They're just conditioned. Yeah. The next is prejudice. That's when you actually believe it. You actually believe that people with mental health issues are dangerous or they're more, you know, th there's an issue. Some who say, you know, that's prejudice. And then the third is discrimination. And that's the behavioral aspect of a stigma, which is really, really, really destructive. So in my own case, I was living with all this in my head and I kind of decided the most scary part wasn't the public. And this might sound weird, the most terrifying part for me was telling my friends yeah, because I thought they would think I was lying to them. And it wasn't me for all this period of time. And actually, one of my friends said, like, you were on medication all this time. It's not even you. I don't even know who I was talking to all this time. And that really hurt. Wow. But the public didn't scare me as much as telling my friends. No, I mean, that really makes a huge amount of sense to me. And I've said this to you before that... Um, I also suffered from generalized anxiety disorder. I had severe panic attacks also back in in the 1990s. And and I didn't tell anyone when I learned coping mechanisms, I left that um, mm. it, as my little secret uh, because I was afraid that I might not get promoted in the workplace, etc. So hearing you say that really, really resonates. And I think there are so many people who are probably listening to this suffering now. Um, and I guess it, it, Kind of the first question I would ask you is, what reaction did you get? I mean, did you talking about your own experience help others to talk about their experience and maybe then get some help? Yeah. So what I did was 
once I told my story, there was a huge wave of people who then came forward to start telling me their story, which in itself was utterly overwhelming because they they thought I was somebody who could fix or solve their problems. And in the midst of all that, I was still in the middle of my own. So I set up Belus for Life, which was basically all it was, was a website or a, a safe place for you to tell your story. And I was able to get, you know, psychologists to offer support to anybody who's telling their story and an aftercare once they tell their story. So it was a safe place where we were able to support them with their language and how they want to say stuff. And if something happened after that overwhelmed them, we'd have a support system in place for them as well. And the reason I said that is because telling the story isn't the hard part. It's the reaction to the story that can overwhelm. And usually it's 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 very, very positive. And even that positive reaction can overwhelm because you're it's just so much information. Somebody might come up, people will come up to me in the pub and tell me about their brother who died died by suicide and they might even be drinking and then it becomes emotive and it becomes difficult because you're now in a duty of care to support them. So the, this type of stuff, we set up a, a, a website, Lust for Life, which then grew into the charity that it is now that's in uh, over 30% of Irish primary schools in terms of mental health models and early intervention programs that we've developed. It's about to go into every art, uh, school in Ireland by 2024. That's what it grew from. Amazing. It grew from a, a safe place. But then from watching the mental health system, and actually, I had a, a a pretty positive experience with the NHS. I have had absolute apparent experiences here. And anyone listening to this that in any way denounces the NHS, don't. It is incredible resource compared to what exists here in Ireland, the HSE. We are we are still using paper. Like we we are we are so dysfunctional for the richest country in Europe, which Ireland is now seen as, our health system. I don't call it a system because systems are meant to function. Mm -hmm. But when I look at it and I I looked at the system, I was like, oh, my God, like, why are young people being failed here all the time? It's because we haven't been created early intervention models of care. And that was what Lust for Life have focused on now. And we are now from first class to sixth class. And then we're moving to secondary post-primary this year. So my aim is by the next five years to have a complete solution, educational solution from from the age of five to the age of 18 that follows them through the whole, so there's consistency through the curriculum. And that's how you solve problems. You do not solve problems by throwing stones at them. You just don't. And you don't solve problems with conflict either. I don't believe politicians don't care about this. I don't believe politicians are big bad bulls. I think this scares the crap out of them. It's the Pandora's box that they don't want to open. And I want to help them. I don't want to fight with them. I want to pick up and talk a bit about uh, Lust for Life because what you've done is absolutely I- incredible. But just before I do, going back to, you know, you talked about the support you received in the NHS and the HSE. I think with something like anxiety, you don't maybe ever fully recover, but you learn coping mechanisms and mm-hmm. you learn how to live with anxiety. What steps did you take um, if, you know, to get to that point, get to where you are today? I needed to get to the core of where it was coming from. Yeah. That was important for me. And actually, really interestingly, I, I I kind of really fell into therapy in a way. And people often come up to me and go, oh, I went to therapy, I didn't like it. You got to show up in therapy. Yeah. Don't walk into a therapy, therapy room and expect your problems to be solved. You have to show up. You have to come and meet them halfway. As terrifying as that is, you have to do that. So I did, and I had an amazing therapist. <clears throat> And the real breaking point for me was I said to my therapist, I'm really anxious. I think it was because of Israel. I think, you know, I had a really horrible experience and they didn't, they didn't accept that. So they did what most people are terrified to do. They're going, let's go into your childhood. I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh no, not happening. Because I had a great childhood. I thought I had a great childhood because I have amazing parents and I'm very, I know what love is. I've had this, I had this deep deep, you know, relationship with my family and my parents. So I was like, it can't be that. And actually what it turned out to be, and this is a story, you know, people like your same generation as me across Ireland, it was a deeply, deeply abusive primary school where there was an incredible amount of physical abuse and unfortunately sexual abuse in Ireland. And <clears throat> The thing about it is I was physically abused by some of the teachers there and so are many of my peers. 
And this is not an uncommon story in Ireland. And the Christian brothers were particularly pervasive. And the Catholic Church, as I always say, if this has nothing to do with faith, if faith gives you comfort, then absolutely rock and roll. But um, it's the institutions that stood over this abuse of children. And I just condition myself to be hyper vigilant because you never know when you're going to be hit, hit by a teacher. And you 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 condition yourself to be to be ready for it all the time. And you're in that mode every time you walk in that school. And you've six years of that. So I just condition myself to be an anxious child, just to be able to deal with that. And then obviously Israel was the catalyst. So when you know that, you start to make sense. And then my therapist was like, the way you feel was a very healthy response to what you dealt with. It was a brilliant way to survive and you did a great job. And it was that, that was a changing point. So he then said, what happens when you do that is, and I'm, I talk about this a lot on my podcast, I'm not giving away my therapeutic journey fully, but what I learned to do as a child was to immediately disconnect emotionally from everything and anything, because it was easier to feel nothing than to feel everything. And that was the problem. I, I wasn't getting into relationships. I wasn't able to commit to anybody. I wasn't able to be with anybody because I was there was nothing there. So my therapeutic journey was rebuilding that. And then it made sense why I was anxious. And then I was there was a little bit of respect for myself to say that actually you did the right thing. You got through it. But now we got to deal with that. And then the toolbox starts coming out. And then you start to understand the physiology of psychotic of 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 anxiety. And the idea, and I always say this to people I work with, your brain is not trying to hurt you. In fact, it's the complete opposite. It's trying to protect you. That's its job. It's trying to keep you safe. It's an alarm system. It's a security guard. And unfortunately, your alarm system keeps going off all the time because it's probably got used to it or it's, it's a bit dysfunctional. And when you reframe it like that for somebody, they always believe there's something wrong with my brain. There's some my brain. I, and, and I always say, no, actually, it's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not comfortable. It's really uncomfortable. But let's get to understand why this exists, where it comes from, and then what are the tools that we can use to help you? That's what therapy can do. And then in terms of mindfulness-based interventions, you start to teach people how to sit with discomfort. Yeah. What's it feel like to sit with that little bit of discomfort that you feel? You know, and then you start to empower yourself to deal with stuff. And, you know, that's just my journey. But I do think if we can create better accessible care for people to make sense of their anxiety, um, it, it you know, and it's not it's not about recovery. My anxiety is an incredibly strong part of me. It's an internal energy I have that has allowed me to do some amazing things. Uh, but now I know how to actually function and deal with it and actually express it. So even today, because to your point, anxiety, you know, we never, we only learn to harness it in some ways. How does anxiety impact you day to day, you know, at this stage of your life? It 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 doesn't really. It it it, it is just an accepted form of my personality that I'm that I, I, I think a lot. Yeah. And part of my job is I'm, I've worked in the creative industry for 20 years. I need to think a lot. It's, it's literally my job is my currency. So I've, I've, one of the things mindfulness teaches you, and I mean, proper mindfulness, not the math mindfulness stuff are often served. It teaches you a sense of self, self-awareness. And I used to go, what does that mean? Self-awareness just seems like something people say, cause it sounds good, but actually self-awareness is the the understanding of the space you take up in society and the space society takes up in you. That's what self-awareness is. You start to realize how you communicate with people, how you interact, how you react, how you feel in certain, when you get anxious, I always say when somebody's anxious, where do you feel it? They're like, what do you mean, where do I feel it? It's because it's completely connected to your body. So where in your body do you feel your anxiety? And they're like, oh, my, oh, it's my belly. I'm like, okay, now we, now we, now we know. Now we, that's your anxiety point. Now put your hand there and now breathe into that and now soften that. And what you're telling them to do is don't avoid it. Yeah. It's there. Acknowledge it exists and soften it with the breath. And what the breath does for me is it's literally a message from the from the central nervous system to the brain but or from the body to the brain and the central nervous system. Step back here, lads. We're okay. Yeah. And it's building that communication between body and mind that is at the core of my work. And the problem being is now in the modern world, 
We have phones to tell us how fit we are and watches to tell us how much sleep we're getting. And we're disconnecting from that experience. And we're, we're t- everybody else is telling us how we feel. So a big part of mindfulness is to tap into that, is to how do you feel? Either good, bad or ugly, but how do you feel? And building that mind-body connection is is at the core of my work. And Niall, I know you give, and I've listened to your podcast quite a bit, you give some really, really great advice. So if anybody hasn't li- listened to your podcast, I'm going to plug a few here now. <laughs> it's it's written behind your head there, where is my mind? Um, but, you know, the, the science behind anxiety, I think is really helpful to understand. But I want to pick up on, you talked about your own experiences in, in childhood, and I think it's incredible what you're doing through A Lust for Life. Um, what I love about it is that you are translating evidence-informed insight around mindfulness-based interventions into real-world impact by getting into the schools in Ireland. You already said that you're now, did you say you're 30% of the schools in Ireland? Is that correct? Yeah, over a thousand schools. So okay. primary schools. Um, and, and these programs are free. That's the other thing. Um, they're basically what we've created is a Netflix model uh, where we put the content into a, a model that is not unlike Netflix. And we build the content out through there, through different threads and strands. The beauty of that is then you can also reach out to other charities who are doing programs in schools. It might be something like consent. It might be something else. But you can then say, build your programs and put it on the infrastructure because then what happens is it, you, you know, it's very expensive to go out to schools. It's not actually that, it's not that efficient, really, if you think about it. You might get to maybe two, three schools a week, whereas you can get to every school in Ireland every single day. Uh, with, as I said, the evidence-based side of it is quite important to make it safe. There's places like that. There's programs like the Dot B model in Australia, um, and Weaving Wellbeing. There's programs are very much focused on emotional literacy. Is is to get kids to understand all the different core emotions and how they how they manifest and and what can trigger them. And yeah, I think it's. And and we're we're still building it out. It's it, it's only started. We're a very small charity. We. We stayed small for a reason because we can make decisions really quickly and we can engage really quickly with people. The bureaucracy is not there. And the other thing is the money that we get through fundraising is so impactful. It literally goes on the programs. And we have like, you know, I think at this point we have about two full time and three part time and and, and then project managers, no offices. We don't need an office, you know, so these are the things we, we wanted to do is is to provide and ultimately what I'd love to be able to do is walk away from it all in 10 years time. Yeah. That's the key. I don't like, I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life. Because it works, because it is now embedded in the school system. Because it's yeah. the, uh, an early intervention model has been created yeah. and it's embedded across the education system. The health system is another, another, like the one thing Ireland has is an unbelievable education system, very respected globally. Uh, I, I personally feel in its current guise our health system's unfixable. I know you're working with a couple of universities as well in Ireland to evaluate and keep monitoring the success and otherwise of um, A Lust for Life. What kind of achievements and accomplishments or, or maybe milestones are you most proud of since creating A Lust for Life? I think the milestone, I think really... There's, there's two things I'm really excited by uh, that I think will be the milestone that I'm aiming towards. But the thing I'm most proud of is, like, this came from nothing. Like, I I, like, I was lucky enough that uh, Paula, who's my co-founder, and Colin know how to build organizations. I don't have that skill. I have literally, and it is a skill. It's a real skill to be able to build out organizations and consult and develop and get that side of things and build out boards and stuff. So what I'm most proud of is that they came in and, and literally saw the need that I couldn't fill. And I think that's the big thing you got to do in this work because there's no ego. There's zero ego here. Like you got to have a vision and that's your vision. So I'm very proud that we built out that schools program because it's really hard because you have to build. There's so many, there's so many stakeholders. So the first thing we did was we put a steering committee together with the t- parents councils, teaching councils, uh, the ombudsman for children. Uh, the best educational experts in, in the country, the best psychologists in the country, and we put them in a room together and they went, we need to solve this. And that is what I'm most proud of because we all dropped the egos at the door and we did it and we built it out. 
and it's not there yet, but it's, it is, um, and then when you start to see the kind of the, the qualitative research we're getting back from like from parents and from uh, like teachers and kids. And one of them was like, I actually am able to communicate what the, what's inside me for the first time in my life. And it's that vehicle of communication. So parents can talk and understand what it is that their child is dealing with. That is a huge, huge that baton I talked about in Ireland, now that baton's firmly being dropped. But the thing I'm most excited by is when you design intervention, whether it's in the workplace or whether it's in society or in health systems, you cannot design intervention until you know what you're dealing with and what the problem is. Yeah. And so many interventions that we see, especially in the workplace, yeah. are actually designed without knowing what the problem is. And in the workplace, often the problem isn't the people are stressed because, you know, life is stressful. It's because they're working 60 hours a week, weeks. You know, you can give them all the resilience programs you want. If you're driving them like that, you're, you're, you're literally rinsing them of their internal energy and they're never going, it's not sustainable. But unfortunately, the, sometimes in the wellness industry, it tells a different story. And there's a brilliant essay called The Privatization of Stress by Mark Fisher that everybody should read. But where was I going with that? Is It's the idea that the intervention we're trying to design for secondary schools, we need to know what the problem is because I don't know what the problem is and either do you. We're not teenagers. Yeah. And what we're going to do, and my aim is to do this and it's slightly ambitious, is we're going to have a youth summit in Ireland and we're going to build an app and the app is going to have 12 questions on it. And our aim is to get it into, into every, onto the, every child, every teenager in Ireland and every school on board. And we're going to ask those 12 questions on the same day. Wow. And we're going to get a state of the union of young people. This is where they're at. These are their needs. And we're going to bring it to government. And we're going to say, now we design intervention with the knowledge that we know. So it's like a real time PhD, like mm -hmm. where you're, you're doing it and you're building it out. And only then do you start working on your intervention. I think what that does as well, it makes young people feel like they've created the solution yeah. and it hasn't been given to them. And um, that that empowering of the youth voice is the thing I'm most passionate about because the other thing you look at, um, I, I like you look at climate change. These are things that mean a lot. For the first time in history, we have a we have a youth generation that care about social justice yeah. and have a social conscience. Some of them can go, you know, almost care too much about it, where they think. We always said within the activism academies that we're setting up, your audience is not the people who agree with you. It's the people who don't agree with you. Stop cancelling them. They're an opportunity. Yeah. Um, and it's this type of mindset. But this is only when we know what the what the, the problem is, then do you design an intervention. And all, the biggest issues I see in mental health is the other way around all the time. Yeah. Um, you brought into this workplace well-being and uh, you, you've hit on uh, probably a bugbear of mine. Um, so there's certainly a view out there that far too many organisations are rolling out interventions because they're trendy um, or maybe to be seen to be doing it, if I'm being slightly cynical, particularly with mindfulness. And of course, you have a master's degree in mindfulness. You have an expertise in this. But there's so much research now that's showing that actually these half-hearted or maybe not properly implemented um, interventions are not having any positive impact on employee well-being. Um, and of course, you've already kind of touched on that a little bit. But what would you say to business leaders? Like, If you had a really proud business leader standing in front of you now saying, oh, I'm about to roll out a six week introduction to mindfulness class, what would you say to ensure that that's actually successful? To leaders, I would say, understand your own psychology before you try to understand your team. Yeah. The best way for you to understand how your teams operate and how they don't operate at times is to understand your own space. Yeah. And I think they often try to do the opposite. They, t they try to look at fix the problems and they themselves are in a position where they might have a board roaring at them every second day, might have somebody above them. And it's, a, it's about the chain of command here. This is where leadership and bravery actually is required. And you do find that there are leaders there that are willing to go there. And there's there's others that are absolutely aren't. And it's not because they don't care about it. It's 
same as the government. They're terrified of this particular subject. You mentioned mindfulness and the research around mindfulness and the research around some of the schools in mindfulness. We need to start reading the research because the research doesn't say it doesn't work. It doesn't work if you do it every now and again yeah. by somebody who's not trained in teaching it. It like the schools one that they did in the UK was so disappointing because it was taught by a teacher. They did it once over two weeks and it wasn't trained professionals. That's like, like there's just try to equate that to something else. Like try to equate that to any other area of expertise yeah. and saying it didn't work. We did it for five minutes. And now that's, that's the research that gets thrown out across the Guardian and stuff like that. If you're going to do mindfulness programs, do the evidence-based ones, the mindfulness-based stress reduction programs, the eight-week programs. But the problem with that is nobody's willing to commit to that. You have leaders to go, we're really stressed, but we don't have time to deal with it. Yeah. It's a vicious circle. And at the end of the day, when you're working with organizations, and when I work with organizations, my first starting point is this place is about profit and productivity. And it's okay that that's its role. And if we all just get that out of the way first... That is the job of any organization that's a commercial enterprise. But the problem is the belief that it has to be at all costs and the belief that you can't develop strategy around well-being. And also, like the thing about it is, it's this myopic view of leadership. Because what happens is you can push people really, really, really hard for a short period of time. And it will yield you results for a short period of time but it will absolutely not be a sustainable way to run an organization. I'll give you an example. I won't mention his name, but a person I know quite well, he is uh, is a doctor and he just actually qualified. He's also a psychologist and he collapsed in a patient after nearly administering the wrong medication to the patient. And a week later, I was asked to come in and speak to this, not no, them not knowing that I knew this. Um, speak to this group and I said he is working 65 hours a week I do not want a doctor working 65 hours a week coming anywhere near me because is he or she is a human being and the human being cannot function like that it needs rest it needs sleep it needs all these different things somehow we think it's acceptable and the one thing I look at in terms of well-being and this is the really interesting. I've seen it from every angle. I've worked with every type of organization. I've worked with all types. I've worked with athletes. But it's this idea of neoliberalism that sees the individual as nothing but a vehicle for profit. And that neoliberal model does not work. And it's actually making society sick because it commodifies human beings. And you know, we it's so clever. We don't even know we're part of it, and it's it's basically why we have a home, we have a housing crisis in Ireland. It's why health is seen as a as a, an area of profit in America. Mm. Health is a human right. Everyone deserves the equity for good health. Every human being does. But in America, we've commodified it into nothing but a profit, which is what neoliberalism does. Mm. So, back to that essay by Mark Fisher, the privatization of stress. The other thing we do across the board is we always put the emphasis on the individual. You, you're just not quite resilient enough. You just need to do a resilience program. You just need to drink more water. Have you tried yoga? And then you go, hold on a sec. Let's strip that back for a second and look at the chaos that surrounds them. Yeah. And look at, for example, in Dublin City, which has got the highest rents in, in Dublin, magically in a period of 20 years, became this become the most expensive city in Europe where it's literally the same rental prices as San Francisco. Mm. And you're telling somebody in a zero hour contract who doesn't know from one day to the next when they're going to get paid or if they're going to get work, who can't pay their rent, who live in an unsustainable living city. And then you say, well, you should just leave, leave Dublin and move out into the country. And then you tell them it's just that they're not resilient enough. So yeah. we need to stop giving the social forces that surround us a get out of jail free card when it comes to this stuff. And it's the same in organizations. Mm. If you are a leader in an organization and you're rinsing your teams, it's not going to work. Yeah. And if you're not actually going to really incorporate what well-being programs look like. And also, it's not it's not your total responsibility to fix all their problems. They have to deal with their stuff as well. But you need to make create an environment and a culture where if they do have issues, that they don't feel like they're going to be judged or they're going to be mm. demoted or passed over 
that's the cultural element. So we hear the word culture a lot. And I'll, I'll finish with this because it's a really long answer because I care quite a lot about this. But I worked with um, a massive organization and two, two of the people that lived with me at the time worked for that organization. And I was doing a, a talk with their with their CEO and the CEO goes up like in front of the whole audience and, you, uh, and they were like, you know, guys, if you're really tired that day, just, you know, just don't come in. Just close the laptop. Don't come in. And I just looked and I went, bullshit. And, and they were like, excuse me? I said, bullshit. You've lost your audience. I said, I've never seen anyone so terrified to close their laptop in my entire life. And you've lost your audience. And I, if I sit here and just say nothing, then I've lost them too. And you could see them going, thank God you said that. Yeah. And that's the difference. And and not not a bad person, but slightly delusional. Yeah. And they create and they ha- and they give them nicknames. If you work in a certain place, we're going to call you this because that's just, that's just dehumanizing. Yeah. And I think to me, I'm very passionate about the individual and what they're dealing with. And more importantly, I work with teams a lot. And you see how, how teams operate when, when you actually care for them and what they do and, and what they're willing to do. Uh, it changes everything. Yeah. I mean, there's so much in that. Um, I, I I do want to pick up on the point as well about, you know, a business's goal being being for profit. There is a lot of new research, very, very compelling research that actually a happier employee is a more productive employee. And all of those metrics that business leaders care about, whether it be employee retention, um, you know, reducing employee attrition or, or stock market, market returns, actually the organizations who have higher well-being scores um, are performing better. So it's definitely in even the most um, profit-driven business leaders' um, interest to actually properly embed yes, evidence-based absolutely. well-being interventions. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's this idea that somehow we, we think it needs to be mutually exclusive. And the reason we do that is because it is a bit scary to think about this and put in the right kind of support systems in place. So you look at things like the EAP yeah. and employee assistance programs and stuff like that. Most people are terrified to use it, you know, and they don't. They also aren't sure of it. Like, and it, of course, it's confidential. Course it's, it's an incredible resource for any organization to offer or to have. And but I just think it's 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 the language and messaging yeah. that if you're telling people it's okay to be like this, and then on the other hand, you're you're literally not. It's a, it, the one thing I've learned with humans is we're very clever. Yeah, we can really stench non-authenticity we really really feel it I think we feel it in our in our entire bodies yeah. so I think you lose your and I, 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 another example of that was like I was part of a, a quite an elite team at one stage of my career and the coach lied to one of the players and the rest of the team found out yeah. and he lost that dressing room and he never got them back yeah. and I think the 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 greatest tool in leadership is real authenticity and vulnerability. Like I, I've done many things. I've done many kind of things that required me to, to really put my head above the parapet. I am perfectly comfortable being vulnerable. I'm a human being. I mess up. I do stupid things. I do good things. Uh, I I fall apart sometimes. Yeah. I am absolutely rock solid sometimes. That's the reality of being a human being. And I will follow, I'll follow a leader that says that because I know they're not bullshitting me because no human on be- being on earth doesn't go through that stuff. So understanding what vulnerability actually is, vulnerability is the real essence of being a human being. And the very definition of being a human being is that you're vulnerable and it doesn't make you less of a leader. It doesn't make you, it, it's the opposite. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. Leadership is such a buzzword. It's just thrown around left, right and centre and like leadership programmes and stuff. And I really think when you just break it all down and just be really human yeah. and, and and people will go to me, well, sorry for you to say you don't run a good thing. I've done that work. I've done those things. I've worked with people. It, it it It's not rocket science, guys. Stop trying to pretend it is. And I think, yeah, and we've all different personality types. You know, you have leaders who are quiet, who 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 might even be shy. But if you're authentic, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Your personality really doesn't matter. If you're actually honest and authentic and transparent, even at times of great difficulty, 
I don't care what personality you are. I, I, that's what I buy into. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We actually had Professor Amy Edmondson on an earlier ep- episode of this podcast series. And of course, she talks about psychological safety. And there's so much in that, you know, definitely being authentic, being vulnerable, and also making it very, very clear that every voice is welcome, but not just saying it once, really in every action you you do, making it clear that everybody should feel that they not only can speak up, but never hesitate in speaking up. And of course, if they're suffering as well, to, to be able to be open about that. Um, and, you know, it really worries me when you say that people are even scared to contact the employee assistance programs, because of course, they've got to be um, completely anonymous and, and, and it's so important. I do want to ask you, because you've done a lot of work with businesses. So you've seen the good, the bad and the ugly of workplace wellbeing uh, interventions without naming and shaming, uh, but which are maybe the best examples of workplace well-being cultures or interventions that you've observed and maybe which are the worst? Um, I think the best are the ones that are, that I didn't expect to be as 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 good as they are and why were they be- the, the, they the best? The best experience I had as I spoke with a very big global uh multinational and the full audience was there the full staff and I got up and I did the speech and the CEO got up after and said that was really brilliant thank you so much and I said how do you know you weren't there and they looked at me and went oh I had to take I said the biggest statement today would have been you sitting in the front row yeah and they were very no, took it quite well because I didn't say it on over the mic or anything like that. I didn't do that. Invited me back. And I said, I'll come back. And did it again. And he sat right up in the front and then got up and talked about his own. And that was that was when I was like, wow, now that is leadership. That is exactly convinced. And he got up and he said, we haven't got this all figured out. And the same thing, we need to know what the issues are here. And we need to be saved. And it was just this brilliant delivery. Yeah. And I was just like, that is, and it, and it wasn't an organization that you'd expect it from. Really impressed to see what, what they did that day and the impact on the room. You could hear the room having a breath. You could see them going, okay, finally. Because it was obviously a high pressure job. The worst, like I've done, I've done talks where nobody in the crowd was allowed to turn off their laptops. And then have to listen to their C-suite tell me for an early hour after how stressed everybody is. Oh my goodness. And looking at me and they, they just wanted me to give them a BuzzFeed article, top five ways to beat anxiety. And I just said, there's nothing I can do to help you here, lads. Mm. And that's it. That's the honesty of it. And don't get me wrong, there's a hundred other people who line up behind me to tell them they'll solve all their problems by giving them like a like a half fast resilience program, but you won't, you just won't solve that. That is not normal. And um, that to me is, is when you deal with that. But I think it's generally different industries. You get like, you get your, like your big fours, your PWCs and stuff like that, who, who really do value it in the EYs because they have to, because then they're advising other organizations in this particular area. And then you have like legal firms that I could imagine an immensely difficult place to work. Uh, I think some of them are doing some really good stuff, but I think I think generally the tech companies have a kind of that lovely little way of making us feel like, and not not all of them, some of them are amazing, but this lovely way of making you feel like they're not making you work hard or work, and it's okay to work. That's the other thing. The thing we have to also be really really aware of is, I, I've been in organisations where people go, I don't, you know. Uh, I had to work and, I, you, you know, it's uncomfortable to work like that. I said, well, you don't have any right to not be uncomfortable either. <laughs> work is hard. You've got to be like, you will be stressed. You will be pushed. That's the nature of work. I, I I, have to do it. I have to deliver stuff each week that puts me under pressure. It's the unrelenting and the, the demands that just aren't really in any way acknowledging the human being in the middle of it all. But 
we also need to be careful here. We are not pushing this Pollyanna view that the workplace is always just going to be great crack where we're doing unicorn, unicorns and care bears up the meadow. That's not life. And we can't sell that as, as life. We shouldn't sell that to kids. Kids need to know life. We can't put them in bubble wrap all the time and tell them life, you get everything you ever want. Everything's grand. You don't need to work that hard for it. And, you know, that's just not true. And teaching that and making that a, an actual a message is, isn't helping nobody. I always use the analogy of in the 80s uh, when anyone got sick, you were just throwing on an antibiotic. I was like, but it's only a cold. You know, here's an antibiotic. I'm like, but then what, how does my immune system work if I keep using something? To, it's the same, you know, if you keep solving everyone's problems all the time and go, no, no, we'll jump in, we'll fix it. They're, they're never going to actually build that psychological immune system I talk about to be able to deal with the inevitable stuff. The first noble truth of Buddhism at the core of mindfulness is suffering is part of life. It's part of your life. You know, we, I wish it wasn't, but it is. Uh, as soon as you accept that, that we all deal with grief, we all deal with relationship issues, stress issues, money issues, health issues, every single human being on earth that ever existed dealt with these things. And as soon as you accept that, ironically, you're less suffering. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, of course, we've talked about, you know, what the large companies are doing, but there's many, many small to medium companies. And of course, you know, you have a few companies yourself, so you are a business leader. What are the top three things that you've done, uh, Niall, to create a positive environment within your various businesses? I think the the first thing I do with in terms of as a communicator, a really effective way to communicate. People always think communication is about talking, but it's actually about listening. And when you have somebody in your team tell you something, always paraphrase it back to them. Yeah. It's a really useful way to do two things, to let them know you've heard them and let them, let them know you've listened to them. And also for your own knowledge, to make sure you've said that you've, you've got the right information. It's just a really lovely way of being emotionally intelligent with people. Yeah. So communication is so, so important. And um, that's why it's the second thing I, I'm going to talk about. There's four types of communication in conflict. And conflict is part of your job. It's part of your life. You're, you, you know, conflict doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're angry. It might be a difference of opinion. Yeah. which you're always going to have. And actually, it's a really healthy thing to have. But there's there's four ways in how we communicate. The first is passive aggression. Passive aggression, And in the history of humankind, passive aggression has never worked. It is the most debilitating form of communication. It is horrific because it has two sides. If you call it out, people will say you're just being sensitive. Yeah. And if you don't call it out, you'll feel disempowered. Second is confrontational, where you just get angry and shouty, and that doesn't work either. It just closes people down. You cannot operate an organization around fear. You can't. It doesn't work. Third is passive communicators. People go, I don't like drama. I'm like, well, tough shit. Drama is part of life. you got to deal with drama. You can't avoid it. If you want to be a leader, it's part of your job. Don't be passive. And then the fourth type of communication, which is the one I would massively advocate, is mindful communication. And mindful communication is quite simply taking off the lens and how you're looking at the situation and putting it on the other person yeah. and looking at the situation to their point of view, even if you disagree with that. That's how you develop emotional intelligence. That's how you create authentic leadership. And then the third one is quite simply, you know, be vulnerable. Just that's, that is the best way to connect with other human beings. I don't mean coming in with like Kleenex hanging out your nose crying. I mean, just being able to say certain things like I've had a tough week or this, you know, like this is my mum's anniversary. It's a difficult couple of days. We need to be comfortable with other people's pain. Yeah. And we need to stop forcing them to internalize and to repress it. And when you do that, you'll start to realize that it's not all so bad. It's actually quite nice. And it's a, it's a huge privilege for somebody to talk to you like that. It means they trust you. You're obviously a nice person and they expect you to hold it. So, you know, and as I said, everyone has different personality types. I'm comfortable with people's pain. Yeah. I'm okay with it. And I, I like talking about, but if you want to be a really effective communicator or leader, really understand the true extent. And the, one of the most important books you ever read is Non-Filing Communication, a book every reader should read. 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to go to what I like to call the rapid fire round, Niall, because <laughs> you've given you've given such brilliant advice. Um, but um, if you had a time machine and you could go back in time to a much younger version of you, maybe when you were a teenager, what advice would you give yourself? Um, I'd love to say don't be all these things and, you know, but like I lived in a different time Um I probably, even if I went back in a time machine, I probably wouldn't have said that thing to me either. I would have said, above everything in life, value your relationships. Yes. Everything in life is about that. Yeah. And your happiness doesn't lie in achievement. No, your happiness lies in connection. That's what I would have said. Yeah. We actually had, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Kelly Harding's work, um, but yeah, she's... No, no. We had her as a guest on a previous podcast, again, talking about exactly that, talking about actually the health benefits of our social connections, not only to our mental health, but to our physical health as well. And the evidence is really, really compelling. Um, Even look at the Emil Durkheim's work around this, the, the theory of suicide. You know, the, the seminal work in sociology is that, you know, communities where there's deep connections and more connections, interactions have lower levels. And this is the reality of human connection and community, how important it is. Um, and your community doesn't have to be massive. Uh, and everyone listening to this, there's a community for you. There is, um, you know, whatever that might be. You might, you might not like crowds. There's other people who don't like crowds. You know what I mean? There's communities everywhere. I think you just need to be open to, to, um, to seeking them out. I think it's brilliant advice. So I'm going to get you to get back in your time machine. Um, and if you go 30 years into the future, what is the change that you would like to see in this world? Like in this world, the change I would like to see, I would like to see social media gone. Yes. That would be a good, I'd love to see that completely. Just, I love technology and I love the internet, but hand on my heart, Social media has made this world a worse place. I, tr I truly believe that. I think the algorithms that they've designed, they operate around the currency of division. That's all they want. The more divided and angry we are with each other, the more engagement they get. On, and I think it's tearing us apart. Yeah. I absolutely fully believe it's tearing us apart. Very entertaining, some of it. Very funny, some of the stuff you go on it. But if we were to do a cost-benefit analysis on this, the costs of social media have far outweighed the benefit of it, in my opinion. Um, and other things I'd like to see, I'd like to see things like health and housing not be for profit. I'd like to see it be a human right. I think if everyone's basic needs were met across the world, uh, we'd be living in a totally different world that's not just tearing the heads off each other for limit, limited resources. So I do believe in the human right of health and housing. Yeah. Wow. Completely agree. Um, so uh, what's the best advice you've ever received? Oh, I think the best advice is actually a quote. OK. And a quote that's two quotes, both by the same person and both by, to me, the godfather of my work and who has probably inspired my work the most. Sorry, three. No, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll give you three. First, are both Viktor Frankl quotes from The okay. Man's Search for Meaning. Between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is your ability to choose and in that choice is your growth. That quote is the very definition of what mindfulness is, non-reactivity and non-judgment. He also said there's, you can take everything from a human except the last of the great human freedoms and that's to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Um, no matter what happens in your life, no matter what freedoms are taken from you, nobody can take the freedom of choice yeah. or, or of, of of choosing your attitude. But the biggest and most important one that drives my work is from an Irish poet and philosopher called John O'Donoghue, who wrote the book Anam Cara. And he said, there's a place within all of us that's never been wounded. And that is the best thing I've ever heard. There's a place, no matter what you've gone through in life, no matter what you're dealing with in life, there's a something in you that's never been wounded, that's unmoving, that's unwavering. Um, and when you feel overwhelmed by the world, tapping into that side of you, Elton John, you know, probably puts it more poetically when he says, you know, I'm still standing. But 
Leonard Cohen even more poetically says, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. And that's the place that's never been wounded. So I believe every human has that. Yeah. And unfortunately, the world has just got too noisy and too wrapped up in stuff that doesn't matter to actually see it. So how do we find that place, Niall? How do we, if there are people listening who, who are really suffering, how do they go and find that place and find them that's never been wounded? They might need help yeah. to do that. And a bit of guidance and a bit of support and a bit of uh, emotional scaffolding around them to do it. And that might be their peers and their family. And that might be a therapist. Yeah. That might be, I don't know, a friend. I don't know. But basically, we all need a bit of help. But I think for me, the place that's never been wounded the way I found it was a meditation. And I know it's not everybody's thing. But to me, I had to cut out the noise and I had to get really comfortable sitting in my own skin. And that's when you start to realize there's something really... In, in, in mindfulness meditation, they use what they call the mountain meditation to kind of help you to understand this as a kind of metaphor where they get you to visualize a mountain, like a profound mountain, a vast, beautiful, unwavering bedded into the earth's rock, really powerful and impressive. And you really get the idea of the image of the mountain. And you talk about the mountain being hit with all sorts of weather and storms. And each season it gets absolutely bombarded with heat and all this kind of stuff. But still it just stands there embedded into the earth's crust. And then you tell them to bring the mountain into themselves. And you tell them to be the mountain. And it's the same thing. We get hit with all sorts of stuff every day, every week, every season. But still, there's something that's just embedded and strong in us. And I think that's the type of language we need to be empowering with people and giving them. Yeah. And this disempowering language and images like showing people in dark rooms with their hands over their heads to portray mental health doesn't help. The toughest, strongest, most impressive human beings I've ever met in my life have struggled with their mind. And I think that is the kind of messaging I think is important. It's not a weakness and it's not a and people aren't broken, they're human. And that's the core of my work is to make people acknowledge that. Yeah, I mean, it's honestly, it's it's so inspiring, Niall. Um, what about yourself? What do you do on a daily basis to look after your own well-being? Um, I think my therapist calls it vitamin, vitamin P, my therapist calls it. I do like a bit of playfulness. I like, I think the world gets too serious. And I think we get a, we get really, sometimes even if you have a bit of crack or a bit of fun, we almost feel guilty about it. Yeah. We're like, oh God, are we having too much? Like, I think you need to let it go a little bit. And the problem with that then is your word, is somebody filming this? Did I do something stupid? Am I going to be thrown under a bus? You got to really just do those stupid things that you don't know why you're doing them. Yeah. Like, what, what, you know, every, everything we do now is, oh, there needs to be a reason. Sometimes there doesn't. And one of the, I, I use this as an example and it's just, it's a silly one, but it's funny. Like my mate who's a biker and he's like, he's like a proper biker. He's a beer down to his belly and big, big boy. And uh, we were in like a, a vegan coffee shop, which was a big enough thing to get him into anyway. And he got all flustered because it was a queue to pay for the coffee and he put his hand in his pocket and he was trying to get that money, but he tried to pay for his coffee with a condom. <laughs> and I I got that kind of giggles where my legs went Brilliant. just because of the context of who he was and knowing that this would be absolutely mortifying for him. And I fell into the corner and he was shouting at me to get up, like, get up. And I was like, no, I, I just didn't care who was looking. I didn't care what was going on. And it, it's those moments of just stop caring about the what the world thinks all the time. And everybody's trying to put on a like a, an image and everyone's trying to perform for everybody else you know I work in a I have a suit and I work in a company and I have no you don't you need to let that go and be a bit of a fool and do all these silly stupid things for no reason otherwise the world is just too intense and and too overwhelming especially in my work my god if I had to do this all the time I'd be I'd be complete disaster zone yeah I love that I love that being playful um 
So on that note, I'm going to ask, um, so much of, of our behavior, of course, is unconscious. Um, and you're now doing uh, a PhD. So in what, three years you'll graduate uh, from the PhD, is that right? Four years, I'd say. Four yeah. years, okay. Probably four years, yeah. So I first heard of you or maybe your band when you had a song, Trust Me, Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. Do you think at some unconscious level that, that influenced your decision to study for the PhD? <laughs> I don't think it's unconscious at all. I think it's very conscious. I I think um no I think it's 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 uh you know the actual PhD thing was it was just such a natural feeling to do it it was just like for the first time in my life education just feels like such a joy it just to, I always was forced into education everything I had to learn was something I was told I had to learn and and I resented it really to be honest with you because it's like that's the way I am if someone tells me I, I have to do something I'll resent it Doing a PhD about something you care about is such a really, uh, it's a real privilege to do it and to actually gain a certain amount of knowledge about something. And what's so exciting about a PhD for me is you're trying to come up with an answer that doesn't exist yet. I love that. I love the idea that like, you know, there's no kind of equation to this. Um, But for me, yeah, the doctor element of it. I, I'm not going to think about that too far, but I I, I can definitely see the uh, graduation um, song as I walk up. And yeah, I, I wouldn't blame them. You'll have to get the band back together, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, they they might actually play it, my graduation. Be if awesome. I graduate. Well, when I graduate, I will when? graduate. I'm you absolutely will. Um, listen, Niall, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I know so many people who feel the work you do is incredibly inspiring and incredibly impactful, um, both the work you're doing in the schools, the work you do through you know all of your advocacy work, not least of, of all your podcast. And we're so grateful that you came on to our podcast and thank you so much. My pleasure, guys. Thanks so much for having me. 